Thank you, David and Sarah and Kristen and Clay and Tom and Alan. So thank you very much for leading us in worship today. I want to invite you to open your Bibles if you have them. I uh, hope you do and open to the, our book of Ephesians where we have been uh, over these last couple months and we'll be here uh, for this next month as well up until Christmas time. So we're studying the book of Ephesians and I want to encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 uh, in the midst of this little letter uh, from Paul to the church at Ephesus. So uh, just to remind us as we, oh, I always forget this thing, uh, as we move into this, we've been, uh, now we're well into the book uh, in the first three chapters. Uh, Paul was just describing something. Uh, he was describing what God has done in Christ by the Spirit. So in reality, he was describing God's triumph on our behalf, what God has done for us in Christ, uh, what he is doing, what he will do. All of that was a part of that. So it's an ongoing project that God's involved in. Uh, and we found out that what he did is he not only delivered us as individuals, right, from the consequences of our sin, he also delivered us from our willing oppression under the evil one. So he made us aware that we're in a spiritual struggle, and he's the only one that has the resources to bring us out of that struggle, to free us from the darkness in our own lives that makes us want to follow the evil one. And so he freed us from the consequences of a rebellion against him. He made us new people so that we have different appetites, different desires. And so he's brought us into a new kingdom. We've been brought out of the darkness into the light. And now we've been made a new individual. And then he brought us to each other. And in the process of, of, of changing us, he made it so that the old hatreds, the old hostilities, the old things that used to mark us uh, in a world where we were competing against one another and using each other, uh, God now has turned us toward each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So he's actually made something new uh, that we're to live into and live out of. And we don't want to forget that when we go to chapter 4, and, and following, we're going to get all of these, do this, don't do, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. But you've got to remember that the only reason that you can do anything in chapter 4 and following is because you've been made different, right? And God has done something in your life. And now he's trying to, it's the God who's loved you, the God who's rescued you, the God who's set his affection on you now and forever, right? You need to go back to uh, chapter 2, verse 7 and read that over a number of times, right, two, seven, eight, nine, right to the end, that he set his favor on you. This is the God now who's trying to help you to live into this new life that he's made possible. So now he's already resourced you, he's already freed you, and now he wants you to live into it. And the assumption is, right, that all that he has done for you hasn't been experienced yet. And so we learned that from the first part, we've got a down payment on everything that's yet to come. We've got a real life, a real change, but we're waiting for God's ultimate triumph yet to come. And so we live in a place where we're freed from sin's power. I don't have to submit to it. We're freed from uh, our willing allegiance to the evil one because I have a different allegiance now. But I'm not free from the presence of sin in my life and I'm not free from a world in which the evil one is active, right, trying to oppose God at every step. And so Paul wants us to live into this new life, to take on new habits, as we understand ourselves differently so that we can enjoy the life that he's given us for ourselves so that we can be protected against the, uh, uh, the, the, the wiles, the methodeos, the, the trickery of the evil one and so that we can be effective as his people for the blessing of other people. That's where he wants to take us. So the first three and now, so we're in chapter four uh, through six dealing with proclaiming God's triumph, the practical implications of God's saving plan. And so I wanted you to take you back just for a moment to the end of chapter 2, <clears throat> just to remind you of what he says has made, been made possible. And the reason uh, every day you're fighting to live into the truth of who God is and who you are. And every day as you get out on social media, every day as you walk around the earth, you've got lots of people who have a different vision of who they are and what matters. And every day God is trying to take you through his word back into your true identity. No, you're not someone that needs to meet the standards of social media to be accepted and liked. No, you are loved. You are fully accepted. You are mine. I love you. 
right? You're my son, you're my daughter, that's your identity. You don't need someone to affirm that from the outside. As a matter of fact, that frees you to actually love people who may even hurt you because now you're not dependent upon their approval. You don't adjust your life based on whether or not you're getting the likes that you want because you're actually motivated by my love toward them to bring them into the joy that you know. So it's a whole different identity that he wants us to enjoy and live into. But every day we're fighting to imagine ourselves as truly who we are. And people are trying to tell you, no, no, you're just that person who doesn't measure up because of your looks. No, you're that person who failed when you were young and you carry that baggage with you, you're useless. No, you're that person that struggles with this issue. No, you're that person who has a broken marriage or you're that person, right, who doesn't have these kind of skills or these looks and therefore you don't really matter and you don't measure up. And God says, no, 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 that's not the voice you need to be listening to because that's not true. And the evil one is in busy undermining the reality that God rules and reigns that he's rescued you, that you're secure in his love, and that you're valued immensely, known deeply, and secure forever. That's the truth, but he's busy undermining that every time you hear somebody talk to you, right? They don't want you to think that way about yourself. They don't want you to enter into the joy of the fact that you know when God forgave you, you know what he did. And the evil one wants to take you back into every failure that you've had and live into that regret. And God wants to say, no, 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 that's not who you are. That's done. This is who you are. I want you to enjoy the life that I've given you. I want to take that that past failure. I'm going to turn that into a sensitivity and an ability for you to love people out of your own failure that you would have never imagined. I'm going to make something beautiful out of that dark moment. I don't want you to hide in it. I don't want you to live in it. I want you to come and serve me as someone who's been changed, right? So that's what God wants to do for all of us, right? In terms of that, he doesn't want us to live here in our past failures, and everyone has one, and probably everyone is struggling with one, right, at this moment. So he's told us this story, and so here's here's this new vision. He lays it out at the end of chapter two. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, right? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, right? They were the ones that were God's spokesmen to give us the scriptures to found this new people, right? We stay on them. But Christ is the chief cornerstone in this household, to use that imagery. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So try to picture this here as everyone walks into this building who knows Jesus, right? You have the life of God within you. You have all of God's riches. You don't come in here as someone who lacks what you need to know life and know it to the full. You have all of God's riches in Christ, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, everything. What we desperately need is a deeper appreciation of what we have, not a sense that if we just had something else, we would really have life. So we come in as producers that are people that have been resourced by God for a new kind of life, a new way of loving each other, a new way of engaging each other, and a true bond has been made between you and I. Even if I don't know you well, I have deep spiritual bonds with you that are eternal that the Spirit has produced. I am a family member, whether you want me to be one or not, right? I am, and you're my family, sometimes even though you're irritating, right? It's more me than you. But we're family, right? And I have been made. My job is to enrich and maintain that relationship. That's my job. That's your job. And I'm resourced by God to do it. So when we come together within the, 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 as a group, we get to experience together another dimension of God's recreating work. He's not only made us new individuals, he's made us a new people, right? And so when you come here, you should see men and women treating one another in the way that God created them to treat each other, respecting one another, protecting one another, honoring one another. You should see families, right, loving their children, right, raising their kids in a way that points them toward Jesus, right? You should see us working at the difficulties that come with our brokenness that's still here. We're people that are pursuing each other. We just don't let relationships fall apart. We don't just write people off. We pursue each other. We repent of our own sin and we go after other people if they're caught in sin because we want to restore them, right? There's a new kind of life so that our corporate existence, the way we are as a group of people, when you walk in here, it's an odd group of people. You can't explain it based on our educational levels. You can't explain it on on our socioeconomic level. 
you can't explain it uh, because uh, we have some sort of hobby in common, right, or whatever the case may be. No, the only thing that makes sense of this group of people with all the differences that we have staying in here and loving each other is that Jesus has made us a people, right? He's made us a people. I don't get to opt out, and I don't want to because I trust the Jesus that this is the environment that I need to shape my, to be shaped into the life that God wants me to know. I need the difficulties of people different than me. I need them, right? And he wants to pull me away from myself and out into the lives of other people. Now, here we are in the middle of this. Will started this off and took us into that opening one, did a great job last time. The questions that Will had at the end of his sermon, which I got to watch. I wasn't here, but I got to watch it. I thought those were just spot on. And I hope that, that you spent some time just reflecting on those at the end. They just stuck me, and I was thinking about them all along as we went during that peak time. We, we are so, um, we know what the evil one is going to do by virtue of what God is trying to do, okay? Paul doesn't spend, this is, you know, many of you that are screw tape letter aficionados, right? You've read the screw tape letters. Uh, this Ephesians is the positive portrayal. Screw tape letters is looking at the dark side, right? Paul doesn't spend a lot of time telling us what the evil one does. He just tells us what God is doing. And we can infer from that what exactly the evil one's going to do. And so two things about the body of Christ that I know he's going, he does and he tries to do. He tries to get us to rally around some other point of unity other than Jesus. Some other point of unity might be politics. Some other point of unity might be uh, our particular tastes and preferences, right? Like I want to be around people that like to drink nice coffee and read books, right? Or want to be around a group of people that like a particular type of music or a particular type of cultural engagement, right? So we gather around something else and, and the evil one wants to distort our identity by getting us to find our identity in something that's not Jesus. And then I also know that the evil one is going to try to resurrect the old hostilities. He's going to try to resurrect old racial hostilities. He's going to resurrect old hostilities from your past. He's going to resurrect the little, the little irritations that happen as you, you bump shoulders with people and people are careless or sometimes they're just downright mean or angry in the body of Christ. He's going to try to heighten those hostilities and get you to kick God's people to the curb and elevate yourself in self-righteousness and move away. I know that's what he's going to do. Because God, everything that's true about God is there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one people. Everything that God does moves us toward each other in Christ. The evil one wants to spread us out the other direction, right? So right now we're going to look at, we looked at the, the constitution and call of Christ's people. Now we're going to look at the passions and the practices. And I want you to come to chapter 4, verse 17. And we want to enter into this new identity is going to be described, right, in, in broad brushes. And then he's going to come down to the old and new, the old habits you used to have that need to be replaced by new habits. And he's going to give us a kind of a summary vision of what this new life is. It, it's, it's kids who imitate their dad. And it's kids who imitate their dad. They look like their father, just like Jesus looked like his father, Right? So he's recreating us to be a new family that has a new father, right? Do you remember back in chapter 3 when, when Paul prayed to the father from whom every family takes its identity, right? That's our father, right? He's given us a new identity. He's prescribed our new potential and our new ability. He's given us a new mission, and he wants us to live into our new identity for our enjoyment, for our protection, Right? and for our ability to bring blessing to people throughout the world, right? On mission. So that's what he wants to do. So let's enter this first one, and let's talk about this new identity to describe, and let's read 417. We're going to read down 417 down through verse 24. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Right? Let me pause there at the moment. Uh, when 
if God has made you for himself, and we're going to talk about this, and ultimately deep down inside of you, you need to have your affections directed to him, right? This is the, the, the first commandment all the way through scripture is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the foundational love that helps you orient all your other loves. And if that love is missing, you're, you're wired to worship, you're wired to love, you're wired to have something that's the deepest affection that drives you. You're made to worship. And if you don't attach it to God, you'll attach it to something else. You'll make an idol of something, right? And it will distort your life. It will distort your life. And because that idol is not big enough to satisfy the deepest desires that you have, you'll always be characterized by more, more, more greed, 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 because it'll always dissatisfy you. It'll always never scratch that deepest itch that you have. Right? Sometimes we make that a person, and we say that I just need the him, I need a her. If I could just get the right him or her, if I could just get the right person, then my life would be put together. And we put weight on that person that they're not created to bear. They can't satisfy our deepest longings. They will disappoint us as much as we will disappoint them. Right? And we'll crush them under the weight of our expectations. And we're setting ourselves up for disappointment and resentment. Because they can't bear that. If we try to find it in drugs or money or popularity, you're never popular enough and you're never popular forever. If you ever read about these people that are influencers on social media, they are on a absolute hamster wheel of trying to be relevant day after day. Right, if you don't post every day, if you don't post regularly every day, and if somehow you wane, well, you can disappear like, like you know, uh, flowers in, in, the, in the winter, right? Pfft, you're gone. Right, you're just irrelevant. And somebody else will come in and take your place, and you're still on this hamster wheel of constantly getting affirmation, and you'll never make it. And then you have to lie about your existence. You have to present yourself out there. And every so often, you'll get one of these people that just crushes under the false world that they've created to try to create people to follow them. And they'll have this you know, little clip that'll come out where you see them without makeup and without filters and without everything else. And you recognize, man, there's a falsehood that this person has lived into. What a sad life this is. But sadly, then we look at that and we say, oh, mammy, I need to get their filters. Instead of, I need to reject that kind of life. Right? So the issue here, it creates this dissatisfaction that can never be fulfilled and you're always going after it, right? So men, if you leave God's boundaries for your sexuality, we'll say this one here, and we're going to get that in chapter 5 the next time we, we're up here to talk, is in chapter 5, you leave God's boundaries, it sets you on this unsatisfiable uh, lust trajectory that distorts your life and misdirects your, your identity. It actually renders, and we know this because of what's happening with pornography, it actually renders young men incapable of responding to a flesh and blood woman. Right? So all the things that we're seeing in the moment, it creates this wheel and we're on it. And if we don't keep coming back to get our identity recalibrated, that's where we're heading. Right? So let's continue. Verse 20, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by, deceitful, by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, now, so one of the things that I just want to bring in from chapters one through three all of chapters one through three should dispose us to say, I really want to pay attention to what, God, what Paul's saying. Why? Because the God who is telling me to live this way is the God who rescued me. It's the God who set his love on me. It's the God who has brought me from darkness to life. I know his intentions. I know his character. And matter of fact, he's powerful too. He's a God who brings everything in conformity to his will. So he's got all the authority to say this, and I know his heart toward me. He loves me, right? So with all of that background, when Paul's speaking now, he's assuming that his readers are going to listen in and say, this is what God says? Okay, that's what I want to do, right? You don't have to convince me that I should listen. What I'm really listening for is how do I do it? How do I do this? 
right? Because I know who this God is. I know what his intentions are. And so I'm ready. Okay, Paul, help. Let's go, right? So that's the kind of attitude where we are. So he does two things here in this one. He wants to say what our identity is not, and he wants to say what it is, right? So he wants to say it's not an alienation from God, yourself and one another brought about through hardness, right? Your heart has been made soft to God, right? What, what the core of that previous identity was is you cut yourself off from God. You were hard toward him and his, his will, right? Your sin, you were convinced that you were walking the right way. Well, God in his mercy broke your heart. He made it tender to him, right? And now with putting God back in the center of your life, you're not alienated from him anymore. You understand who he truly is now. He's not some killjoy in the sky who's trying to take the fun out of your life. This is your father. He loves you. He's rescued you, right? And, and, and it's shocking because you didn't deserve to be rescued, so this is your dad. This is who this is. And for everybody who's had a crappy dad, this is the dad. So stop, stop putting your, your crappy dad on the father and let the father give you a picture of what a good dad is. That's dad. And he spills out his love on you forever. That's who he is. Right? So you know him. He, he, your heart is not hard to him anymore. It's soft to him because you trust him. You've been loved by him. You understand who you are now. You're not dumb. You don't think you can make it on your own. You don't think that you've got life by the tail, that, that if you just organize things right and manipulate people in your life and get enough money and do these things that you can make it. No, no, no. You recognize that you're, you, you need him at the center of your life. You're not hard to that anymore. Right? Now, we fight living back into that life all the time of being independent from him. But we understand that. And we, we know about who people are. People are not means now to elevate myself. They're not people to be used or exploited. They're not people who can actually provide complete security for me. Because they're not somebody that I desperately need to tell me that I matter. They're not somebody that I desperately need to provide for me what I truly need. No, no. God does that. God does that. All right? So... I, 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 don't, I don't have an old hard heart anymore. I'm soft to that. So this is Augustine, one of his famous, you know, our hearts were restless before because we had shut God out of them and our hearts were meant to be directed toward him. And when we didn't direct them toward him, it didn't stop us from being worshipers. We just put them on something else. And then our new identity, what it is, it's a new life made possible by learning Christ. Now, translators struggle with this passage and when they translate it, it's a, it's a weird thing. He says uh, straightforwardly in a kind of an awkward way, he says, you have not learned Christ, right? right? You've not learned Christ this way, right? And so Christ is at the center of this picture, and we're going to find that he's still there in chapter 5 and verse 2 because he provides the ultimate example of someone who is living out this new identity. And that's why at the end he's going to say, be imitators of your father just like Jesus, Right? And so to learn Jesus is to learn someone who fully trusted in the Father, who did everything in conversation with the Father, who was completely obedient to the Father's will. He let the Father tell him who he was. He let the Father tell him what mattered. He served the Father at great cost to himself because he trusted that what the Father was calling him to do was the best thing for himself and for everyone. And it cost him on the cross. That's Jesus. So do we trust this Father, right? So we welcome Him, Jesus, as a living person, and we're shaped by His teaching, right? Now, I, I want to say this here for Paul, for us. Do, do you stop and think of Jesus as a living, ruling, reigning Lord? Right? When you're, you're walking through the day, Right? Jesus has brought you to himself. He's made you his very own. He's fulfilled you with all of his riches that, he has, uh, that, that God has given to him. All the resources you have, he is your Lord. He wants you right, to follow him, to serve him, to love him. Right? It's not that you're following a way of life or a set of principles or a checklist of cool things to make your life well. Right? or some basic principles to keep people off of your back, or how to deal with conflict. No, you're, you're coming alive in Christ, and you're following your Lord out into this new life, because heaven, heaven at its center 
It's not mansions and gold streets, fun moments, right, as we envision them here. The center of heaven is Jesus. I just uh, did a funeral this past Monday. You know, I've told you we're just kind of, I feel like our family's in kind of a season of death at the moment. We've been in and out of funerals and walking with people along the edge of the valley. And I just read again from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to comfort one another these, with these words that those who are dead in Christ, right, the reason why we know that the coffin is not the final word, why? Because Christ resurrected from the grave. And we are going to be resurrected by him. And so one day he's going to return. And you know how the, 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 the whole section ends? And so we will be forever with the Lord. Comfort one another with those words. Right? That's, that's, so he's calling us to Jesus, to be taught by Jesus, to walk in his steps. Right? That's what he's calling us to do. The Jesus who came and sacrificed himself on our behalf, who took into himself the wrath that we deserve so that we might have the life that he won. That's the life you want. Right? And so you have to keep coming back all the time to say, really? What, what, what kind of life do I want, God? This kind of life. Okay, God, I'm trusting you because it seems to be a hard path right now. No, trust me. Trust me, it's the life you want. Okay, follow me. Right? So this is where he goes. Now, so move to the next one, 425 to 52. Let's read through this section. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Let me prepare you. I prepared the people in the back room. If you don't have your toes stepped on today, you, you just have to be asleep. That's all I'm saying uh, today. I just had my toes stepped on all week this week, so I'm going to come step on yours a little bit today. And it's not because... Uh, it, that. that when God, you know, this is when God loves us, He loves us too much to let us walk in the old habits. I love you too much. No, 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 don't, don't walk in that old way. You're robbing yourself of life. And so here's what He's going to say. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give a devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you have been sealed, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. All right? So let's pull this apart, right? And there's a bunch of things here, and if you have your notes, uh, you can fill in the blanks that are there, and hopefully... So follow along as we work through these. Now, as I looked at this, I actually wrote my notes very short today because you could preach a sermon on any one of these things, right? So I'm just going to hit a couple things, and I prayed and said, God, help me to hit the one thing that I need to hit with regards to these. But notice here, there's a put off, put on. And this is the language that Paul often uses, right? There's a bad habit that needs to be replaced with a good habit, Right? So we're putting on, putting, and Scripture never, never is a negative guide, right? Uh, sometimes, I know I've said this to you before, I have a couple that's dating, they're getting serious with each other, and they don't want to mess it up. They don't want to go physically places where they shouldn't go and cloud their relationship with all kinds of negative things. And so they get together and they have this conversation, they say, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, and we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that. And I said, well, that's great, but you can't exist as a couple not doing things, right? So what are you actually going to do as a couple? And scripture is always saying, this is the old self. This is who you used to be. These are the patterns of your old life. You used to be a liar, right? Because that's, that's useful. Lying, right? Liars can get some stuff, right? I'm not going to say anything about what's happening currently in American culture, but liars can get a lot of stuff. They can acquire a lot of power by lying, Right? Lying about people, lying about things that happen, lying about what their legislation is going to accomplish. Lie, 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 lie. You can get all of it, right? It's an effective mechanism to get what you want. Right? You can do that. 
You can lie, right? That's an old habit, and we don't, we don't, no, speak the truth, right? And so it's not letting go of something, it's replacing it with something else, and by virtue of the fact that you're heading in a different direction, the other thing is in the rearview mirror. So it's not that you're watching all the time not to lie, no, you're watching to tell the truth. I want to tell the truth. And because you're telling the truth, you don't lie, right? So it's not that you're standing there trying to strip things off with nothing new to put on. You're busy trying to put new clothes on so that you create new habits and you just become a person who doesn't lie, okay? So that's what we're going to go after. So let's talk about a few of them here. And notice how this first one here, I was thinking about this. He says, don't lie to one another. Think about this. Don't lie. Therefore, you must be put off a falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. That's what made me say, don't infect the body with lies. Right? You're a part of me. I'm a part of you. Whatever we talk about, you're injecting that into our system. Right? And of all things, we as the people of God, the one thing we don't want to lie about is who God is, who Jesus is, and what our identity is. This is why we need to walk with God on our own, because when we come in, right, in, we're impacting one another. Your demeanor when you walk in the building, what you're thinking about, right, how you've dealt with your past week, right, all that comes right in with you, right? And so when you come in, if you're not walking with the Lord, your own attitudes and behavior and expectations are not informed by His, and so you're going to rub off on all of us, and we do that every time. We're broken, we come in and we do those things, but we're impacting one another. And I don't want to discourage you. Okay, this is something that happens to me as a pastor all the time. People want me to be God's voice to approve their sin. Pastor, I want to talk to you. I'm thinking about leaving my husband. Why? Well, I don't think those are reasons you should leave your husband. Let's hang into this. Well, there's no abuse. This isn't happening. Let's stand here. No, I came to you as the man of God so that you could affirm my already you know, chosen course of action so I could feel good about where I'm going. Well, no, I can't lie to you. I can't lie to you. I I'm called by God to bring you to the face of Jesus. And he says that's not good. So I'm not going to tell you it's good right? So as we as the people of God, we need to walk with him so that when we come to represent God's will, because you're going to be asked by people in the, in the lobby in different places, all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you're giving somebody advice or where, you're try, where, where they've, got a, they've got a difficulty going on in your life and you're trying to figure out how do I help them? What do I say to them in the moment, right? Well, you certainly don't want to be Job's wife, right? Curse God and die, Right? You don't want to be that. You, know, you, you want to turn them to Jesus. You want to go to Jesus on their behalf. You want to say, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but let's pray. We need some help. Right? You don't want, want to discourage them and say, well, God's absent. God wouldn't let that happen. Right? This is, no, no. You want to turn them toward Christ. People who tell the truth. Right? And this is one of the ways we don't lie about the nature of our Christian life. Now, that takes wisdom about this. Right? We can be very good at disinviting people into our lives, and we can lie in a lot of different ways. Like, I'm fine. Things are great. No, really, how are you? No, things are great. And, and the answer is, no, they're not great, and I'm not being honest because I don't want you poking away in there, and I want to deal with them. Okay. Don't lie about it. It'd be better for you to say, things are difficult right now, but I really don't want to talk about it. Okay. But don't lie about it. You follow me on that? Yeah, another way we lie is we flatter people because things get awkward. You ever been in a situation where somebody says something that really makes you uncomfortable and you get one of those nervous laughter, <laughs> like that, and you're saying to yourself, ooh, that was, that was uncomfortable and I wish that person hadn't said that. And we don't say anything or, right, we, we say, you know, we laugh and we let it go and we've flattered that person and we've not represented Christ there. And it doesn't mean that we jump up and say something, but it means that we go over and we grab the person and we say, you know, hey, I love you as my brother and sister. Tell me a little bit about what's going on. What, what are you talking about here? Right? We, we as the people of God are not people who are called to lie to one another. So we don't want to misrepresent, misrepresent Christ. Now let me say one last thing about this one. I, so many things on my mind. 
Your praise, your vocabulary of praise, speaks about your values. Okay? Where is your praise taking the people in your life? Are you lying to them through your praise to encourage them to value things that are not really that important? Are you taking them toward, right? So I know I had I four daughters in my home and uh, there's a lot of things about body stuff and all those kind of things like that. And a lot of times when you hear guys and girls talking to one another, their vocabulary of praise has to do with how good you look, right? Okay, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But very little of the vocabulary of praise has to do with, with looking at the character of the person that they're looking at. And if your vocabulary of praise is always about a person's outward appearance, always about their achievements, then you're shaping their identity toward valuing that above everything else. You're lying to them. If you're talking to them about their walk with Jesus, if you're commending the fact, man, I love, man, the other day I was watching you out there yesterday and that person was so rude to you and you were so kind and patient to them. I was just praising the Lord for what he's done in your life and I'm just so thankful for the kind of person that you are. You know, I heard about this and I know you didn't want to know, you didn't want anybody to know about it, but I heard about, about you, you, you helping this person and it took a lot of time, took a lot of energy. Your selflessness, man, that... That was so encouraging to me. Honey, I, one of the things, I, I've told my wife this so many times, uh, my wife is a, is a woman who is a hard worker. She's diligent. She takes her responsibility serious. I never have to worry about meeting someone in the city of Xenia that goes, you're Rana's husband? Oh, wow, I wondered who that man was, All right? I never, I never have to do that. Usually when I meet her, I have, meet people, I have them come to talk to me and tell you, you know, I, I really appreciate your wife's work. She prays for me. She knows me. I just, I, I, I appreciate her as a friend, right? And I, I want to go over to my wife and say, honey, I am so thankful that you're that kind of woman. Are we praising people toward the truth? Are we encouraging them to adopt a system that's really a lie about what matters? Okay. So that's one. Okay, now, second one. Be angry and don't sin. Be angry. Now, this is, this is an odd way to say this right here, to be angry and don't sin. I thought we weren't supposed to be angry, right? Now, there's some debate about this, but I think it's an actual command. And, of course, Jesus was angry, right? Jesus got angry. God gets angry, right? But he's saying here that, that there are certain things that should make us angry, right? When a child is abused, we should be angry, right? When, when a woman is treated as, as, as an object, we should be angry about that, right? We should be angry about those things, and the question is here is, don't let the anger go sideways, as he wants to say, because you need to be angry at the right things and at the right proportion, right? So you need to be angry at the things that make God angry because as the people of God, we should not be happy about sin in our midst, okay? And that, this is not be self-righteous, but this is, no, I'm really concerned because I believe, I believe what God says is that the real threat to the people here is not really the physical threats that they face, it's the spiritual threats that they face. And if they're caught up in something that's living over against where God would have them to do, I'm really concerned about that. And I hate the impact that it's having on their life. If you want to read about this in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul says that real repentance comes when you get angry at the sin that has owned you. Indignation is the term. Okay? And so we need to be angry. But anger, you don't want it to go sideways. And this is why Paul gives this classic advice, don't let it persist. Right? Now, I don't think he's giving a hard rule that you have to look and we've got 24 hours to resolve this. Right? And I'll just say that straightforwardly. That never worked in my marriage. Still does not work. Right? The 24-hour rule, the question is you need to resolve it as quickly and as effectively as you can. You don't let it sit there and let it fester. Because right? it sits there as it fester, it turns into rejection of the person. It turns into hatred. Right? All those kind of things that can happen. You don't let it fester, so you go after it. Well, I've learned, right, in terms of the dynamics of our relationship, sometimes we start off trying to deal with it, and it goes south, right? And so then we just have to do a timeout. Timeout, right? Go to your corner, 
right? Get yourself together, right? I know that never happens to any of you guys. I'm just telling about my experience, right? So go to your corner. Let's think it out. But then we have to, okay, honey, we got to come back at it, right? And I've told you this before. When, when, when Ron and I were married, Ron was in a family that duked it out all the time. They just never resolved anything. They just yelled, brought it up. I mean, there was something in the middle of the room. Everybody was screaming about it. But nobody resolved it. I lived in a house where if there's something in the room, everybody's circling it and not talking about it. So Rana came at me like that, and I just circled a little bit more, got passive aggressive, and she's going at me like that, and then she was losing respect for me because I was backing away from the issues, right? And so when I actually, by God's grace, started coming back at her in the right way and saying, okay, honey, we need to do some things, our conflict actually went up because she wasn't used to having to resolve the conflict, and I hated the conflict. So I didn't manage it very well either, right? Well, in a church, it happens all the time. Somebody does something stupid. Somebody uh, neglects something. They drop the ball on a responsibility that makes you have to do something that you shouldn't have to do. They aren't thankful for something that you do for them. All that kind of stuff happens. Right? Well, you've got to resolve that before the Lord quickly. And then he says here, don't let the devil come in and grab it. Okay? You, you think... Here we are in church this morning. The evil one is active. There's no neutral territory. Right now, he's probably trying to make you irritated by something that I just said, right? Or by what somebody else is doing next to you, right? Or you're thinking about something that happened this past week. You know, whatever the case may be, he's not there absent. Any little thing, he wants to take a little scratch and he wants to rip it open and make it a gash, right? And all of a sudden, people who are, used to be brothers now are, no, I hate that person. Now, they won't say it out loud because we're too sophisticated to say that, right? I don't say that directly. It just sounds too ugly. Okay? All right, it's enough of that one. Next one, right? Don't steal. Work. Now, notice here, work with your own hands. Be responsible to provide for yourself. To the degree that we're able, now listen to me carefully, to the degree that we're able, a follower of Christ's works. They labor to meet their needs and the needs of the people they're responsible for. They don't view it as somebody else's responsibility. Okay, that's very clear. Paul's saying this straight out. The mentality of a follower of Jesus is that you take responsibility to provide for your needs. And it's not only that. He says you want to do something good. Right? You want to do something good. You want to love your neighbor through the efforts that you give. And there's a lot of goods that are produced by people here at EBC. I was just trying to list some of them. Right? There are some people that the good that they provide is they create a clean environment that we get to enjoy, that actually facilitates the, the meeting that we have together. Some of that do, do it in homes, some of that do it here at church, but they provide a good for us that we all get to enjoy. And I'll tell you, when that good is not provided, we as pastors get to hear about the absence of that good, especially if it's the women's bathroom that's not clean, right? So some people, they provide right? Administratively, they help people like myself be organized and move the mission forward. So they bring a skill to the table that I don't have to enable us to function as a community. We have uh, uh, Steve in here who provides protection for our neighborhood. We have people that are working in the community to try to help the city work so that, so that we can get around and we can go to our jobs and that we can have a place that's safe to live. Those are all kinds of goods that we want to do, right? but there's certain kind of work we don't want to participate in, okay? So here, do something good so that, and then here, people who are believers, we never live up to the full extent of our income. Now, follow me with this one. We don't live to the full extent of our income, right? The normal trend for most people is you live up to the level of what you make. Paul says, no, no, people who are followers of Jesus, they always live below their income so that they have extra to give to people who have need. They always live below their income because they, they want to have money on hand to meet the needs of other people. They plan to do that. Right? They plan to do that. So it means I'm not going to spend all the way up to here, and it certainly means I don't spend beyond what I need, what I have. Right? My wife and I, we sit with young couples all the time. We, we go after them all the time because of our experiences that we've had. You live within your income. And we set up a budget. And I said, the one thing you don't want to do is spend more than you have. And certainly don't put it on credit cards. Okay? Now, all the, now I've seen young couples, $30,000 in debt on credit cards. Right? 
Now, a Christian says, no, no, I got this amount, God, and I trust you that this is what you've given me. Now, I'm going to live below that because I want to have money in case one of my brothers and sisters come into a situation where they have need. I want to provide for it. So we work with our own hands, and we do something good, and we live below what God gives us so that we can have to give to those people in need. We plan on that, all right? The next one, we don't tear down, we build up. And so here is that famous Uh, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, right? So here is we want to speak God's truth. We want to speak what's true because God's truth is what they need to hear. They, They forget who they are. They forget what matters. And we need to keep helping them to remind. We need to help each other. You know, one thing that my wife and I say to each other, sometimes when we're fighting, you know, we only do that, you know, we did that once in 1985. Now, when we're struggling together and we're having things like, sometimes we'll have to look at each other and we'll have to say the truth, say, honey, I love you, we're on the same team. We're on the same team. So whatever we're going, we're on the same team. And so, and God has called us and brought us together So I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. We're going to hang in here over time until we figure out how to work it out because that's the truth of who we are and what really matters, and that's important. And we believe that God's goodness is to be found by me sticking with you and you sticking with me forever. I'm doing that by faith, right? My wife is doing it too. There's plenty of times she's going to go, God, are you sure that me sticking with this guy is really going to be good for me? By telling her the truth, who's who we are and who's who God is, and this is what he tells us, and we trust him, right? So I want to speak what's truth. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit because you know what the Holy Spirit is trying to do? He's trying to enrich and deepen our relationships with each other. So if I'm not speaking grace-filled to you, if I'm not speaking the truth to you, then I'm not trying to facilitate what the Spirit has done and what he wants to do, Right? Okay, finally, don't harden your heart, open your heart. Okay, here's what he says here at the end of of, uh, four. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, I'm, I'm just, this I think Paul is talking about right, we're going to come to our, our, um, our memory verse, remember that back from chapter 4? He said here right at the beginning in verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. If you have been around any person or any group of people and you have stayed with them, it's taken a lot of patience to make that happen. It's taken a lot of forbearance. It's taken a lot of, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's taken, no, I'm not walking away, I'm coming back. And what happens over time, if you get people that that rub you raw, is you start to write them off. And your heart gets embittered toward them and you close your heart off to them. I'm not going to open my heart to you anymore. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to be around you. Where are you sitting in here? I'm sitting over here. What group are you in? I'm not getting in that group. Now, we're sophisticated enough as adults. We don't show it outwardly. We just quietly adjust our lives to keep other people out. And we don't deal with the darkness that's there. And so we get bitter, angry, cut off. We don't pray for them. We don't desire their best. We're just trying to figure out how to marginalize them. And so Paul said, no, no, you've got to continually, by the Spirit's help, you've got to keep opening your heart up again and trying again and going after it again, right? And any of you know, right, in terms of uh, sometimes when you get hurt by somebody, are are you sure, Jesus, do I have to open myself up again to them? No, Jesus says, I've loved you deeply, I've loved you securely. 
You're never going to lose the love that sustains you and, and holds you. And I'm going to transform you, Greg, that you're willing to sacrifice your comfort and the potential injury because you love them more than you care about you being comfortable. So you're going to go back after them and have another conversation. You're going to pray for them. Yeah, I'm, I want you to get on your knees and pray for them until my heart becomes your heart. Don't let it get hard. In your marriage, with your parents, you see kids that get hard hearts toward their parents and they shut them off and they cut them out. That's the work of the evil one. That's the work of the evil one. If you're getting hard-hearted toward your wife, that's the work of the evil one. If you're getting hard-hearted toward your husband, that's the work of the evil one. If you've written people off, that's the work of the evil one. Now, I'm not talking about there's wisdom in terms of how you engage people who are broken, who hurt people, but God never abandons people. I'm glad he doesn't abandon me, right? So our final one then is just five, one, and two. Just as in Christ, right, follow exa God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know that the Spirit of God is working in you. When you come away from engaging in people and you are glad to have poured your life out on them, you know, you don't, you don't have any, you talk to grandparents frequently, they don't complain about pouring their lives out on their grandkids, right? Now, the mom and dad of the grandkids may, may complain because of the impact of the grandparents, right? But they, they, don't, they don't complain, right? They don't see that, no, no, I'm willing, it's a joy, it's a delight to pour my life, right? If you're a parent, it's your delight to pour your life out on them. Right, this is what you do. That's what love does. That's what Jesus does. He pours his life out on us. And when we look like Jesus, right, the end goal of Emmanuel isn't to have a smooth program running. Right, it isn't to have you know, the, the, the most pristine, you know, admirable environment that we have. It's for us to, to come to know Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus, lead other people to Jesus, enjoy him together. That's where he wants to take us. And he wants us to trust him to go past my fears, to go past my selfishness, to go past my past injuries, and say, okay, Jesus, I trust you to open my life to these people. I'm not going to hide on the edges of the community. I'm not going to hide in plain sight by just talking about everything and staying out of the lives of other people. God, I'm going to deal with my anger and my bitterness. God, heal me, please. I trust you to move toward these people. So I say that to all of us because that's the heart of Jesus. Every day you fail him. Every day your obedience is less than full. Your affection is less than passionate. You get distracted. You wander off. You misrepresent him in the conversations that you have. You get freaked out about things that make him seem very small. If he was really big, you might not be so worried. All those things happen every day. And what does Jesus do? He keeps coming toward you and saying, you're my daughter, you're my son. I love you too much to leave you in that silly place. Come on, come back. Turn your back on that, come back over here. That's what he does day after day. He's going to do that through eternity. And one day he's going to be a plus up where we won't have to wrestle with that anymore. Our time's up. I'm going to pray for us at the end. So David, I'll call a little audible here. Would you just stand with me as we, as we finish up today? You know, I think about all these things. I, I, I struggle at times to be honest. I struggle. Sometimes I'm lazy to do the hard work that God calls me to do relationally. I tell you, relational work is really hard work. I know I've said that to you before. To love another person well is really hard work. 
because it pulls at all the dark stuff in your soul, right? We want to back away. We want to protect ourselves. We don't want to trust Jesus to move toward each other, right? I, I sometimes in my mind, even if I don't say it out loud, I, I'm, I'm saying unkind things about other people in my mind. I'm sophisticated enough to know that pastors shouldn't say that out loud, right? But that doesn't mean my heart's always right with people that have hurt me or injured me. Sometimes I struggle with somebody injuring me and wanting to go back after them. Do you ever struggle with that? I struggle with that. I don't want to go back after them. Do I have to, Jesus? Yes. That's what I did for you, Greg. You've been forgiven tons. How can you not forgive so little? Right? So God is calling us as his people into a journey to imagine us for who we are as his people who have been retooled, remade, and called on a different mission. We should look different, sound different, want different things, praise each other for different things than we often find. God, help us to do that. Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindness to us. Lord, you are so uh, gentle. Oh, we're glad that you're a God who doesn't give up. Lord, we know that for many of us, there's just many, many failures. Lord, in small ways and sometimes in big ways. But Lord, you're a God that pursues. You're a God that brings back. You're a God that turns us away from the things that we've uh, latched on to that are killing us. And Lord, you're the God that wants to, to bring us to life. And Lord, you want to protect us from the wiles of the evil one. You want us to so get who we are and who you are and what our mission is that we just know and we don't get tricked. And Lord, you want us to be a new kind of people that are on the same mission together, serving the same Lord. Lord, help us as your people. Uh, Lord, we just, we just ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.